Greetings. This is the lecture for uh, lesson number eight, covering the first half of uh, John chapter six. But before I begin, let's uh, let's prepare ourselves. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, you're uh, you're uh, a God of mighty deeds, of great power. You speak, and things come into existence. You can fix the broken. You can heal the sick. Lord, I pray now um, as we look at this chapter and we look at the mighty works of your son Jesus, um, we pray that we would um, see him and see those works for the even greater work that is being done that you do in our lives. Uh, Lord, we pray now that uh, your Holy Spirit would um, work in our hearts and minds here to solidify the truths that we find here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the things that I think is distinctive about me is the fact that I, I, I like to cook. And because of that, I oftentimes watch cooking shows on television, trying to learn learn new, new recipes, learn new things. And uh, years ago, there was an interesting show that I used to, that I would watch that was entitled Dinner Impossible. It was a takeoff on the old uh, show Mission Impossible. And in Dinner Impossible, Robert Irvine was the sh celebrity chef. And in, in each episode, he would be given a mission, should he choose to accept. And that mission was always to prepare a large banquet-type meal for several hundred guests. And he would have about six to eight hours to pull this off. Now, in that time, Chef Irvine would have to decide the menu, determine the quantities, go buy the food and prepare it all in time for the guests. And it was always fun to watch the chef and his staff scrambling to put all of these uh, large dinners together. But as challenging as his dinners were, his missions were, they don't compare to the feast that Jesus and his disciples put on this week. Dinner Impossible was a, quite a production, but, but at most it, it, they served 200 to 300 people. Tonight's lesson describes a spontaneous meal for 5,000 plus people. Now, while it involves real physical events and practical lessons for service, the lessons also, this lesson also provides for spiritual truths. Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. So that speaks to its, uh, its importance. John, is, in particular, helps us make, uh, uh, make a, a spiritual connection. Um, the most important event in all of the Old Testament is the Exodus. And John connects chapter 6, the activities in chapter 6, to the Exodus story. Jonathan Pennington, a, a gospel commentator, calls this story in chapter 6 a better exodus led by a better Moses. And I think you'll see his point in my outline. Three parts to our passage this week here. First, we're going to see Jesus feeds the 5,000. That's the first 13 verses. You know, after the Israelites left Egypt, they quickly became hungry and began to complain. Uh, God responded by sending them manna from heaven. Well, this miracle of the feeding of the multitude here uh, will illustrate who Christ is. You're gonna, he's gonna make the, the, we're going to make the connection that he is the bread of life. And, and as his disciples were to serve him, serve Jesus as the bread of life to others, he is all-powerful, all-sufficient to meet our needs. And then Jesus uh, avoids the people's attempt to make him king, verses 14 and 15. And then briefly, we'll look at the, the crowd and how they saw Jesus' miracle and made the connection to Moses' prophecy concerning the, the prophet to come. The people's plan for Jesus was different, though, than what God's plan was. You know, sometimes we try to get God to conform to our ideas, a sovereign God will not be manipulated by men. And then John walks on the water. That's verses 16 to 21. The Israelites 
left Egypt by way of a miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. But in this passage, Jesus will demonstrate his power with another miraculous water crossing. The Christian life, we're going to learn here, is that the Christian life is no promise of fair sailing. But God does promise to be with us and to guide us through the inevitable storms of life. So my goal here for this lesson is that we will all come to realize that Jesus has the sovereign power to meet all of our needs in the course of our spiritual service. So, if you would open up your Bibles to John chapter 6. The scene between the end of chapter 5 from last week and the beginning of chapter 6 changes here. Previously, Jesus had been in Jerusalem attending a Jewish feast, probably Pentecost, and while there, he was defending himself and his actions against the Jews. But here in chapter 6, we find Jesus back in Galilee. Verse 1 begins with the phrase, sometime after this. Again, we might ask, how much time has elapsed and what has taken place in the meantime? Well, if we were to piece together the different four gospel accounts, we can infer what some of the things happened. Obviously, Jesus left Jerusalem and returned to Galilee after the feast. Most pilgrims would have done that. In Mark's gospel, though, uh, prior to the events of this lesson, Herod Antipas had imprisoned and ultimately executed John the Baptist. So John is probably dead at this point. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that at this time, Jesus had sent his 12 disciples out, and he gave them the power and the authority to cast out demons and heal diseases, and they preached the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, when the disciples returned, Jesus decided to take them away for some R&R, &R, much needed. But, so, you know, so many people had been coming to them, they didn't have a chance to rest or to even to eat. Now, all of this probably took place over seven to nine months of time from last week's lesson. So Jesus took his disciples and they rode along the North Shore to the far side of the Sea of Galilee. That, that would have been the east side. We, we know from the other Gospels that the people, seeing Jesus leave by boat, ran on foot uh, to intercept them. And just as Jesus and the disciples sat down on the mountainside. Jesus saw the large crowd coming toward them. Now, had it been me, it pro I probably would have gotten quite upset, but not Jesus. Mark 6 says he looked at the large crowd and had compassion on them. And because they were, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, when Jesus looks at the world, he doesn't see people as they appear. He sees them as they really are. He sees people in need spiritually. And he knew the nature of their faith, that it was only based on his miracles. And he knew that eventually that he would leave, they would leave him. But, but that knowledge did not stop him from loving them and doing what was eternally good for them. Mark says he taught them many things. And Matthew adds that he healed their sick. Seeing their need, Jesus intended to meet that need. Now, since Philip was from nearby Bethsaida, he asked, he asked Philip where they could buy food. Where's the nearest Costco? Now, I've always thought that Philip had to be an, was a, was an, an engineer. The idea he would have kind of, wouldn't have whipped out his calculator, but he was certainly calculating his mind. And he looked at the, at the crowd and he determined that Eight months of salary would not come close to feeding this crowd. Now, just like I said last week, Jesus doesn't ask questions to gather information. He was asking questions to make them see the need and to make them see who he is and what is possible through him. While Philip was focused on the enormity of the problem, Andrew was discouraged by the lack of available resources. In Mark 6, 38, Jesus had instructed his disciples to go out into the crowd and determine the available resources. Canvassing the crowd, Andrew found one young boy with a sack lunch, five barley loaves and two fish. 
Now, these barley loaves were the bread of the poor. And they weren't large loaves of bread like we buy in the store. No, these were probably small cakes or, or biscuits. And the fish was probably pickled. Both Philip and Andrew saw the hopelessness of the situation. But the boy, he was at least willing to put his lunch in Jesus' hands. This was a teaching opportunity for the disciples. He had them organize the people, seating them in groups on the grass. He took the loaves and he gave thanks to God and he distributed the bread and fishes to those who were seated. Just like Dinner Impossible, where the chefs passed the food to the waiters who then distributed it to the guests. Here, the disciples took the food from Jesus and passed the food to others to extend the distribution. At the end of the meal, Jesus had his disciples gather the leftovers, not wasting anything. 12 basketfuls gathered, more than what they had started with. 12 baskets, one for each disciple. While John portrayed this event as a miracle, not all scholars see it that way. Those who are philosophically disposed against miracles have come up with a number of explanations. Some say that what actually happened was that it was a, a merely a symbolic meal, like a communion service where each got a little dab of something. Or the boy's example of sharing his lunch inspired the entire crowd to, to, to pull out their hidden food and to share communally with one another. Another explanation was that, uh, was that the, the actual miracle was that the entire crowd was physically satisfied with the tidbits that they received. But none of these explanations really square with the crowd's desire to make Jesus king. But, but there are a number of lessons that I think we can pick up from this count. We, we, we kind of saw them, covered them in our lesson. The, the, the story models how we need to approach God's work here on earth. We, we need to see the people as Jesus sees them, sheep without a shepherd. People are no different today. We, we, we seem sophisticated, but, but we are just as needy, just as fearful as the crowd. People today need Jesus Christ. We need to have compassion on people. Jesus had compassion on these Galileans, even though they had imposed on his agenda, even though he knew they had fickle hearts. And we need to have compassion on others, even as we know that we will often be rejected by them. We need to be willing to set aside our agendas to serve others. Jesus went away with his disciples to give them rest. That was until he saw the crowd. And it's been my experience that acts of compassion and mercy, when they come up, it's never convenient. The opportunities to help others will always require us to change our course for the day. That is, they come at a cost. And we need not be intimidated in our circumstances. We'll often be dwarfed by our circumstances, but, but we must remember that our circumstances are dwarfed by God. Our God can do anything he wants, and he has an infinite imagination, so we need to be open to his creative work on our behalf. And we should not despise the resources that we currently have. What is available is what God has already given to us. Be thankful for it and bring it to God, knowing he will use it for his purposes. We must make what we have available to God for use. Uh, that young boy, he can get lost in the story, but he was the one who gave his entire lunch for Jesus. What an example and what a blessing he must have received. We should give thanks to God for the available resources we have. He's the one who has provided all things, and we should give thanks publicly. God alone deserves the credit. And we need to trust God for the adequacy of our resources. We serve a God who speaks things into existence. He's far more powerful and creative in his solutions than we are. If we believe who he is, then we must trust him. And then we must be organized in our efforts. Order allows for a wise stewardship of our resources, our time, our money, 
our talents should be organized so that we will be used effectively by God. This has been one of the great lessons for me. You know, some people think that the structure, uh, that structure stifles creativity, but not for God it doesn't. The structure of Bible study fellowship allows us to put our efforts into what is important. That is the teaching of the Bible, the shepherding of people. And we need to involve others in our work. God chooses to use people to further his kingdom. He doesn't have to, but that's his chosen way. He provides the blessings. We provide obedient labor in his hands. And in the same way, we need to involve others in ministry. You know, as I look out over our class, the number of people who are involved, the group leaders, our admin leaders, our volunteers, substitute teaching leaders, area personnel, each is vital. And we can't waste the God's blessings, can we? Just as Jesus had his disciples pick up the leftovers, we ought not to waste God's word. His provision is more than adequate for our needs but we must handle the Bible properly. And notice how the disciples ended up with, with what, uh, more than they started with. Ask any leader in this class, he'll tell you that he gets more out of service than he puts in. Now, everything I've just shared with you really are practical lessons for our service to God. But actually, the most important truth of all concerns Christ's sovereign power. And that principle is that our resources in the Lord's hands can accomplish far more than we can imagine. Your little in God's hands is a lot. And the reason this is true is that your little came from God in the first place. And it is true when we are serving him in absolute dependence. Hudson Taylor, um, longtime uh, missionary to China, uh, said it best. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. When we are obeying God's commands and serving according to his will, he will provide for the needs of our ministry. In this miracle, the disciples were closer to Jesus than the people. They saw firsthand his provision. Each time they went back to refill their baskets, there was more bread and fish available. Today, our efforts are fueled by God in the same way. The blessings that flow to people come from God, and they far exceed what any of us bring to the table. Our role is merely to distribute God's word. And that is exactly what we leaders here do in BSF for you men. We receive from God and pass on to you. And in the end, we are all greatly blessed. We all receive in abundance. Today, there are people all around us who are spiritually starving. And so the question for us is, what is our response to them? Are we like Philip? Are we like Andrew? Or are we like the little boy? You are gaining knowledge of our Lord that few people in the church have today. And with that knowledge comes, I think, the obligation to distribute it to others. And this passage teaches that Jesus will take our offerings, meager as they are, and accomplish far more than we can imagine. Now, <clears throat> once the people realized this miracle that uh, Jesus had performed, they reasoned that he was the one prophesied by Moses back in Deuteronomy 18. Moses had said that the Lord would raise up a prophet like himself from among the people. And Moses, remember, Moses had fed the people when God sent manna from heaven. Jesus had just fed them. Moses had delivered Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Surely Jesus could deliver them from the hated Romans. But the people misunderstood the sign. They thought the kingdom of God was to be an earthly one. Jesus will later tell Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. Jesus' physical miracles always point to a greater spiritual truth. In next week's lesson, Jesus will explain that truth when he describes himself as the bread of life. Jesus did come to bring freedom to the captives, but it was a freedom from 
the bondage of sin, not, not the Romans. John says that uh, the people wanted to make him king by force. And this was probably the high watermark of his popularity and may have been one of his greatest temptations. It's similar to Satan's temptation in the wilderness where he offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, if only he would bow down and worship him. In both cases, the temptation was for Jesus to take the kingdom without going through the cross. And this was not the path uh, that his father had chosen, and so Jesus refused. John the Baptist had called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus had to be the Lamb before he could be the King. So he went and sent his disciples away in the boat, and then he withdrew up on the mountainside to be alone with his father. The strain of the day and the great temptations to yield to popular opinion all must have weighed heavily on Jesus. So as, his, as was his habit, he would retreat to be alone with his father, to listen to him, to speak with him. These times must have been times of great encouragement and renewal. And, and we need to have these sort of things as well. Because when our view of Jesus contradicts with the Bible, like the, like, 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 like it, the people had, we are the ones who are in the wrong. But we must adjust our understanding of our sovereign Lord and his plans, not the other way around. And we need to do that by spending time with the Lord. And note how Jesus resisted popular opinion. To resist our culture, we need to spend time with the Lord. Jesus did. And we need to as well. Later in this gospel, he will teach us that he is the vine and we are the branches. And so the connection to him is made through our prayer life and through listening to his small voice. And so the principle for these verses is that Jesus' sovereign power will not be used for our selfish purposes. The people had one view of Jesus. In their minds, he was potentially their big sugar daddy, providing their daily bread and leading the nation to freedom from the Romans. He was the Messiah who would fix all their problems and make their life easy. That has always been our problem. The, the God of the Bible, the true God, is not the God that we want him to be. His holiness, his absolute goodness, his sovereignty, they offend us. Uh, the way he works in the world and his timing, they don't fit into our schedule. That dissatisfaction is the heart of idolatry. It's a recasting of God into our image rather than submitting to his revealed nature. We see this today where we make God, uh, we remake God by focusing only on specific aspects of his nature. That is his mercy and his compassion. And then we ignore his holiness and justice. Our, our culture will also try to change us. So as we grow in our obedience to Christ, people will start saying, you're taking this Christianity thing too far. You're, you're making me uncomfortable. You see, the darkness is always uncomfortable with the light. People don't need a Jesus of their own making. They need the Jesus of the Bible. And so I ask you, how are you trying to cast Jesus into a role more to your liking? See, Jesus was tempted to be the king that the people desired rather than the savior that God willed. He is our example, and we must recognize that temptation to make Jesus fit our desires rather than to, than to worship him as he truly is. Now, while Jesus was praying, the disciples were out on the lake rowing back uh, to Capernaum. In verse 18, it says a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. These severe conditions are often common there on the Sea of Galilee. The winds come down off the western mountains and make for tough rowing and even dangerous conditions. So the disciples were out rowing through, through the night battling the winds and the waves. 
And when they had rowed three to, say, three and a half miles, they, they saw Jesus approaching them, and they were terrified. Mark's account says that they thought he was a ghost. That phrase translated in the NIV as walking on the water can also be translated as walking by the water. Again, those who don't hold to miracles postulate that Jesus was merely walking along the shore or maybe on a sandbar. That doesn't kind of make any sense. Um, had they been close to shore, his presence should, have, should not have frightened them. Now, clearly, the intent of John's gospel, as well as the synoptics, is that Jesus supernaturally walked across the surface of the lake. Job says of God, He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. If God exists, then miracles are possible. And all of this occurred during the fourth watch of the night, roughly from three in the morning to six. So the disciples had been rowing throughout the night. In verse 20, Jesus responded by saying, It is I, don't be afraid. The phrase translated, it is I, literally means I am. This is the phrase that Jesus would later use in the gospel to describe himself. It is the phrase that God described to, G to Moses in the burning bush. Knowing it was Jesus, they led him into the boat. And then we see the third miracle for this passage. John says they reached their destination immediately. And yet this passage does provide us with a couple of lessons. A life in Christ will not be free of troubles. In fact, a life in Christ is a guarantee of storms. The reason the disciples were out in the storm was precisely because Jesus put them there. They, were, they had obeyed him by getting into the boat and rowing back to Capernaum. Mark says the disciples had not understood the miraculous feeding. So Jesus put him in that storm to display his divine power over creation again. The sight of Jesus walking on the water showed him for who he is. He is the king of creation. Initially, they were terrified, but soon he'd comfort them. And you and I will experience storms as well. Some may be due to our own sin, uh, but some will be from God for the purpose of strengthening our faith in him. When we are struggling and seemingly alone, Jesus is not far from us. He sees us. Being physically removed from Jesus, I'm sure the disciples felt that he knew nothing of their peril. He could not help them. Nothing was further from the truth. Jesus saw them straining at the oars even while he was still on the mountainside. He sees you and me when we're struggling. As our high priest, he's always interceding on our behalf. And we need not be afraid. Again, from Mark's account, Jesus told his disciples, take courage, don't be afraid. When Jesus is in our boat, there's no room for fear. And we need to keep rowing. These disciples were exhausted having rowed throughout the night. It was all they could do, but it was all they were required to do. Jesus had put them in the boat and sent them on their way. They were being obedient, and we should too. When we find ourselves in a storm, we must not quit, but stay at our task. And then with Christ, we will ultimately reach his intended destination for us. It may not happen immediately like it did here. Having Jesus with us, we will make it to the end. We will not be lost. And so that leads me to our final principle, and that, that Jesus' sovereign power will see us through the storms of life. Some follow Christ in the belief that they will make, uh, uh, he will make our current life easy. They, they've not read the Bible. Jesus promises storms for his children. Some will be by God's design to strengthen our faith. Others will be of our own making. Still others will, be, will come from opposing the world. Jesus does not promise a carefree life. He promises that when the, but he does promise when the inevitable storms come, he will meet us in those storms and bring us home. Paul says in 
Romans 8. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask you, what storm are you going through right now? Finances? Family problems? Health? Jesus knows your situation, and he is ready to come alongside if you just ask him into your boat. And with that, let's pray. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, um, we, uh, we again confess that we oftentimes uh, put, uh, put you in a box, um, limiting your ability or limiting what we think you will do in our lives. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, we will see, see these truths here, that your sovereign power can do anything that you want, and that uh, your, you act out of our eternal good, not necessarily making our lives comfortable. Heavenly Father, I pray that, um, that these truths here would be solidified in our hearts, Help us to see that um, you are always with us. You always see us, no matter what the state is, and that you deeply love us and um, have our good in mind. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.